Now let's say that we have a battery. Uh, we know that batteries give energy to electrons. This is the positive side, this is the negative side. And uh, let's say that we just had a circuit, quote unquote, where we just had two plates. And, uh, and we turned this circuit on. Is anything going to happen? Yes, because this battery is going to take electrons from this plate here, and it's going to push them onto this plate here. So we have this plate becoming positively charged, this plate become equally and oppositely negatively charged. If we then somehow cut the circuit there, we've now got two charged plates. We can then use that charge usefully to do more things, but that doesn't work very well. In order to store charge effectively, you need these two plates to be very close to each other. That's what we have in a capacitor. A capacitor sort of looks like a battery, but it's not. The two lines are of equal length. It is basically what its circuit symbol is. It's just two plates very close together, but not touching. If the circuit was turned on, then the battery will take electrons from this side of the circuit and ultimately from this place of the capacitor and dump them by moving them all the way around onto this plate here. So we end up with a positively charged and negatively charged plates. This one has lost electrons, this one has gained electrons. Let's say that we then cut the circuit. We've got another circuit attached in parallel and we've got a bulb in there. What happens? These electrons want to get back to this plate here. They can't jump straight across. As soon as they jump straight across, the capacitor is broken. They move all the way around the circuit, through the bulb and back to the other plate. And in doing so, they light up the bulb. So this would be the sort of circuit that you have in your camera flash. So you need a lot of charge moving very quickly through a bulb to get a bright flash. So it charges up the capacitor and then the capacitor discharges through a light bulb. Capacitors can also be used to smooth out AC current that's been rectified. So if we've got a current that looks like this after it's been rectified, then that's not going to be very good for our electronics because we want a nice smooth DC. So what happens? DC is pumped through a capacitor. As the current goes up, it charges the capacitor and then at the top, the capacitor then discharges slowly instead of the current dropping straight away and it carries on like this. It can also be used in radios and it's used in computers as well for timing and we'll get on to how time is involved with capacitors a little bit later on. So there's pretty much everything that you need to know for GCSE, so let's go into the A-level stuff then. So let's say that this battery can supply a voltage of six volts to the circuit, to the capacitor. Now, as soon as we connect the capacitor to the battery, if we had a voltmeter across here, what would it read? To begin with, that would measure zero volts, because to begin with, these plates are gonna be uncharged. So that begs the question, where's the rest of the six volts? Well, that's actually gonna be taken up by the resistor. But as time goes on, as this capacitor becomes charged, the PD across this capacitor increases, and it's going to increase to a maximum of six volts. So that's where it's going to end up. So if we draw a graph of what's going on with the PD over time, we're gonna see this shape here. And it's gonna level out at six volts. The PD across it can't get any higher than that, but that's when it's fully charged. That's when we can't fit any more charge, any more coulombs of electrons on these two plates. So the question is, how much charge can you fit into a capacitor? Well, this depends on the capacitor. In order to find that out, we do charge equals current times time. Problem with this is that we have to assume that the current is constant. And that's generally the way it's going to go. In reality, the current is going to change as well because it does have to end up at zero ultimately when this thing is fully charged. But more often than not, we have to start with the assumption that current is constant. So let's draw our circuit again, put a switch in there this time. And what we can do is vary the PD available from the battery. So one volts, two volts, three volts, four volts. And then we can see how much charge is being dumped on this capacitor. So if we have PD across here, and we have charge up here. What do we get? A lovely straight line. There is a constant associated with this capacitor and we call this capacitance. And this tells us how many coulombs can be stored on a capacitor per volt of PD applied across it. 
So the capacitance of a capacitor is charge stored per unit PD per volt. Now the unit of this is going to be Coulomb per volt. So the unit of this is going to be Coulomb per volt, but we give that the name the farad. So if we had a capacitor where we applied a PD of one volt across it, and we stored one coulomb of charge, that would mean that the capacitance of this capacitor would be one farad. However, in reality, a coulomb being stored by one volt is ridiculously big. What you'll find in reality is that capacitors usually end up with capacitances of microfarads and nanofarads and even smaller. So we can say that C, capacitance, not current, not charge, but capacitance, is equals to charge divided by PD by voltage. So our equation is Q equals VC. That's our equation for capacitors. The charge stored across a capacitor is equals to the PD applied across it times its capacitance in farads. So we know the gradient here is the capacitance, Q divided by V. But how do we find out the energy that's stored in here? Well, we know that voltage or PD is energy per coulomb, so energy divided by charge. So that means that energy is voltage times charge. When we have a graph of two things that are times by each other in an equation, that means that it's the area under the graph that gives us that value. And it's the case here as well. That gives you the energy stored at that PD. So in reality, the energy stored in a capacitor isn't VQ, but actually, because it's a triangle, it's actually gonna be half QV. What we can then do is also put this into here. So we end up with half C V squared. So that's also another way to calculate the energy stored by just knowing the voltage and the capacitance. Hold up a second though, you might be thinking if the energy given out by the battery is QV, but we're actually only storing half QV, where's the other half of the QV gone? Well, that's lost in the resistor, and if there's no resistor, it's gonna be the wires. So when you're charging a capacitor, half of the energy is always lost as heat due to the resistance. And unfortunately, there's no way around that. That's the way it has to be. So we talked about capacitor charging, but now we're just gonna be concerned with the capacitor discharging. So we're gonna pretend that it's fully charged, so then we can just ignore the battery side of this. Now we have a resistor in there. Don't forget that this is what happens to the PD across the capacitor when it charges. It levels out to the maximum. Incidentally, what's going on with the current? Well, we know the current starts off quite big, but then as the capacitor gets more charged, the current actually does that. But we're now more concerned with discharging. And yes, we were charging through a resistor. If it wasn't for that resistor, it would charge like that. And here we're discharging through a resistor as well. Otherwise it would discharge like that as well. Even though the PD and the current graphs for charging are different, for discharging, they're actually the same. They're actually the same. And we get an exponential curve. And this is pretty much exactly the same as the exponential decay of a radioactive isotope. And it turns out that we can model the decay that's going on here much in the same way with this here. The voltage at any time compared to its initial voltage here, and this goes for current as well, is equals to E to the minus T over RC. So that's E to the minus time over resistance of the resistor that it's discharging through times the capacitance of the capacitor. What's weird is that if you boil ohms and farads down to their base units, it ends up coming out as seconds. That is the only way that we could have minus T over this is if they have the same units. So this here is just a ratio. So if we're interested in knowing how long it takes for the voltage to half, then V divided by V0 is gonna be a half, 0 0.5. Much like radioactive decay, we're interested in what happens when this here equals e to the minus one. When the time that we're looking at equals RC, that means that these two things are gonna be the same number. So that means we end up with e to the minus one. And e to the minus one is always 0.37, or 37%, if you will. So when our time is equals to the resistance of the resistor times the capacitance of the capacitor, we know that we're going to get 37% of our initial value. So that's about here. And when that's the case, we've hit our time constant. So that means that RC 
is what we call our time constant. And naturally, if you're trying to find this ratio here, then we just need to plug the numbers in there, time, resistance, and capacitance. If it's the other way around though, and we're actually trying to find one of these things up here, then we need to take logs of both sides, and then we can rearrange to find either time, resistance, or capacitance. If you're asked to find out the time constant, then obviously you're going to do log of 0 0.37. Just a couple of things as well. We have capacitors in parallel, What's going to be the same for them? They're going to have the same PD, same voltage. But because we've got two capacitors, we can fit on twice as much charge. So therefore, the total capacitance, also sometimes known as C equivalent. By the way, this only works it's twice as much charge if they have the same capacitance. It's just going to be equals to the capacitance of the first one plus the second one. For capacitors in series, they have to have the same charge. Because we have this isolated circuit in the middle here, there's no way that we can have a different charge on this one compared to this one. And we know that the voltage is shared as well, much like resistors, but uh, what happens? We end up with one over the equivalent capacitance, one over C1 plus one over C2. Do you notice anything weird? For resistors in parallel, we end up with this equation, but with resistance in there. But for resistors in series, we just add up the resistances. So capacitors have the opposite equation, if you will, from their resistor counterpart. Now, the reason that a capacitor works so well if the plates are so close together is because we have an electric field in between. So there's our small version there. Positive plate, negative plate. It takes energy to force the electrons onto here, but, because they're very close to the positive plate, they're somewhat attracted to the positive plate as well. So that makes it easier to put charge on plates that are closer together. Now turning this, now turning this on its side, you have a positive plate and the negative plate as well. If I uh, draw this a little bit 3D, then we have two parallel plates that have a certain area. So remember that the higher the capacitance, the more charge you can put on a capacitor with a single volt. So capacitance, if we want to figure out how to calculate it using what's going on here, we know it's going to be proportional to the area because of course, the bigger the area of the capacitor, the more charge you'll be able to fit on the plates. It's going to be inversely proportional to the distance. The smaller the distance, the bigger the capacitance, the more easily we can put charge on it. Now, the last thing that you need to know about is what's going on in between. Now, because we have an electric field here, we have to take into account the permittivity of what's in between. Now this here is the permittivity of free space. That tells you how strong an electric field can be if it's made in free space, which for the time being, this is. So that is just a constant and it has the units farads per meter. But more often than not, we'll have something in between the two plates. We call this a dielectric. Again, it's non-conductive because we don't want charge to leak straight from one plate to the other. But this thing has a relative permittivity and it's gonna be greater than one. It's just a number that tells us how easy it is to set up an electric field inside of it. So what we do is put in here as well, our relative permittivity. Incidentally, if you charge a capacitor, but then you increase the distance between its plates, you actually reduce the capacitance now there's two things that can happen here. If battery is connected, then you're gonna get a constant PD. So going back to our formula for energy, E equals half CB squared. That means the energy is decreased. The opposite of that though, if the battery is disconnected, then the only thing we know is gonna stay the same is the charge. Now for this, we use the formula E equals half Q squared over C. This is just a rejigging of our formulae from earlier. See if you can figure out where that comes from. And so that means C decreases, so the energy actually increases. That makes sense, I guess, doesn't it? If you move two plates away that are attracted to each other, you're putting in work, you're putting in energy. So that means the energy has increased. And of course, we can change the capacitance of a capacitor by removing and inserting a dielectric, and uh, that has then the same effect. So I hope you found that helpful. If you did, then please leave a like. If you have any comments or questions, leave them below. And I'll see you next time.